All right, guys. So this is um, my first time recording a video for you guys. So hopefully this uh, this goes well. And I wanted to start with the uh, the poem that you had for your essay, um, your essay test. Uh, this is from the 2002 AP, the uh, free response question number two. Um, and it's called The Convergence of Twain. It is a poem by Thomas Hardy. Uh, interestingly, um, and probably surprisingly, given what the poem kind of says, um, Hardy was uh, asked to write a poem um, for a fundraising event, uh, basically to raise money after the disaster. So this poem came out in 1912, um, and it's maybe now ironically uh, cold towards you know the death of 2,000 some odd people. Um, so I'm not going to go through the whole to be cast thing. I'm really going to focus on um, the prompt and then each individual stanza looking for poetic devices that you might have discussed in your essay. So the prompt here says, read the poem carefully, then taking into consideration the title of the poem. That's kind of, sounds kind of key. Um, it's just a reminder that the po uh, that the title is often um, useless until you've read through the poem, but also hinting towards the major theme of the poem. You do not necessarily need to discuss the title of the poem. It's simply reminding you that you can consider that and that might actually help you distill meaning. Um, continuing, analyze how the poetic devices, typical, although here it does not list any poetic devices, convey the speaker's attitude towards the sinking of the ship. Um, so this is really what they want us to focus on is, is attitude, is tone, how does the speaker feel about the fact of the sinking of the Titanic? And your thesis needs to some way, shape or form um, make an argument about the speaker's attitude towards this thing. And for you know high scoring one also, you know which poetic devices uh, best exemplify that. I came up with a bunch of poetic devices that I'm gonna go through here. There's probably, I mean, I know for a fact there's way more that I did not highlight, um, but these are the ones that if I were writing this essay, what I might focus on. Granted, obviously I would not write about all of them in 40 minutes. I'd probably choose maybe two or three and write really strong paragraphs around them. Um, so with that, we'll just uh, get into the, the poem. Uh, the Convergence of the Twain, um, subtitled Lines on the Loss of the Titanic. And if you didn't know what the Titanic was, although I can't see how that would be possible, um, we get the footnote. And these footnotes were not mine, these were uh, from the test. All right, stanza one. In a solitude of the sea, deep from human vanity, and the pride of life that planned her, stilly couches she. So um, immediately I have a rhyme scheme, and that rhyme scheme, uh, you know, to tip my hand a little bit, is AAA. Um, so we have an AAA uh, rhyme scheme going for all 11 tercets. So you could definitely talk about rhyme scheme and the fact of tercets, and if you're going to discuss how they um, uh, affect uh, attitude or tone, you might argue that the, uh, the, 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 the short rhyme sequences um, hint towards like the, this inevitability, like crawling towards some, something in the way that the boat and the, the iceberg are, you know, going to meet at the end of this. Um, so I tried to like kind of color code just depending on stanza, always going with yellow and it made the most sense. Um, and first thing we get uh, a lot of imagery here uh, of words that kind of, um, hint at uh, stillness and isolation, right? So solitude, deep, stilly, and couches. Couches meaning to sit, but think about what a couch is, kind of like to sit lazily, crumpf down, right? Think about a boat hitting the, uh, the bottom of the ocean. Um, we also have some, uh, some personification going on with um, the diction around here. Uh, and the pride of life that planter. So the ship was planned, her is, we're just describing the, the Titanic, and the pride of life is a thing that planter, and this is uh, hinting towards um, the poem's kind of fascination with, with hubris and uh, man going well beyond, um, not beyond what they should do, obviously at the end of the day, she's a boat, uh, but that there was hubris involved with uh, the, the path that they took and how fast they went, uh, calling it the quote, unsinkable ship. And then, you know, fate had its way. Um, so moving along, uh, steel chambers, late the pyres of her uh, salamandrin fires. Uh, it's, the, it's a weird adjective, it's a very old adjective for um, uh, the, the red as a salamander. Cold currents thrid and turn of rhythmic tidal liars. 
Okay, so firstly, we, the orange here, uh, I mean, it's not really an allusion in the sense that it's to a specific book, um, but like the pyres, the liars, these are uh, kind of like ancient, uh, ancient Greco um, images that we use uh, often for um, like the death of something heroic or liars would be used uh, by bards to sing songs of praise, songs of um, great warriors, et cetera. So here it might be kind of like pseudo ironic use. Um, as well as the juxtaposition, which is this yellow section here, fires and uh, pyres and fires. So pyres are literally fires and then cold currents thread. So the, uh, the, a lot of imagery between hot and cold, um, the, the heat of the, the, the excitement of what the Titanic was supposed to be. And then her like cold, deep, you know, bottom of the ocean um, resting place. Um, again, salamanders uh, were uh, supposed to basically be immortal um, at least to live through like flame. Uh, so think about, you know, that as kind of a, a, a an interesting inversion, this thing that can survive fire um, as, as like a kind of a symbol here as the, the quote unsinkable ship. Uh, so stanzas three and four, um, I have this red thing is just to kind of mark the, the similarities uh, that, that, that I'm find, finding them to be connected. That's probably a better way I could do this, but I couldn't figure it out this morning. Um, so structurally, we have two very, very similar stanzas coming up. Over the mirrors meant to glass the opulent, the sea, worms crawl, the sea worm crawls, grotesque, slimed, dumb, indifferent. So here we are using imagery where the, the camera has gone from outside of the ship to inside of the ship. And we can imagine like in the, ball, the grand ballroom, um, dining, uh, the dining room, that you have mirrors all over the place where the, the, the opulent, meaning the rich, are able to look at themselves in these opulent, rich mirrors. Um, and the juxtaposition of what these are supposed to be, what they're supposed to represent, these gorgeous gold framed mirror pieces of art um, are now just covered in like gross, like literally grotesque, slimed and dumb um, worms. Dumb uh, meaning silent, in case you didn't know that. Um, and also that the worms are indifferent, but I put that in a different color because this is where I think the first time the, the, the speaker really leans into um, one of the attitudes that you might have said he has towards the sinking of the ship. Um, uh, uh, there's a, there's a, um, so a, 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 a detachment. Sorry, that took so long to come up with that word. Uh, it really sucked to watch on YouTube, but I apologize. Um, so similarly, so the structure here between stands three and four is you get yet another like gorgeous, expensive thing juxtaposed against um, this kind of new reality. Jewels and joy designs. Also, but I'm not mentioning it every time. There is a ton of alliteration in this poem. And here's a great example. Jewels and joy designed to ravish the sensuous, not sensuous mind, lie lightless, all their sparkles bleared and black and blind. So going from the, the, the joyousness of that J alliteration to the B, 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 that kind of like thudding alliteration, uh, going from like these things that were shiny and awesome and rich and new, and now all lie without light at the bottom of the, this black ocean um, with no shine in them whatsoever. Moving on to stanza five. Dim moon eyed fishes near gaze at the gilded gear and query, meaning ask, what does this vain gloriousness down here? Um, so obviously we're personifying the fish. Uh, the fish are speaking, asking a question. Um, and we get this awesome uh, word that Hardy invented for this poem, vain gloriousness. Uh, it's, it's kind of on the nose in terms of like, you know, hubris, um, pridefulness. Um, but as if, you know, if we're, you could talk about the imagery of like the, the fish kind of just floating around like, oh, look, there's a ship here, what's, what's that about? Um, and then this dot, dot, dot is, is useful for a few reasons, um, most, mostly because it's highlighting um, pretty overtly that we're, we're approaching a shift. And there is a huge shift in, uh, in tone between stanzas five and six, which I'll discuss here in a second. Um, well, that's another way to show that uh, we, we've shifted the dot, dot, dot. We're moving on from this like image of like this camera panning through the ship and seeing the fish and all the the, the worms, um, and now the the speaker is kind of more specifically addressing uh, maybe the problem with 
you know, this boat. Well, while was fashioning this creature of cleaving wing, it's a gorgeous um, image for, for, for a boat, the imminent will that stirs and urges everything prepared a sinister mate for her, so gaily great, a shape of ice for the time that in dissociate. So again, the cleaving wing here would be um, the boat, but notice we have the, our first use of stanzas being enjammed together, right? So everywhere else in the poem, we've ended with Sashira, specifically full stop periods. And here at the end of stanza six, we introduce enjambment. Um, and enjambment is introduced with the, uh, another introduction of a quote character, the imminent will, whether this is uh, God, fate, whatever really doesn't matter. It's called the, Im the imminent will here. Um, and while the poet, is trying to control narrative structure in the first half, first five of the 11 stanzas, um, similar to the way that we, we as humans trying to control the ship, control the ocean, um, create something unsinkable that would laugh in the face of nature. Uh, similarly here, the, the control around the poem, it, uh, once will, it comes in and like um, instills itself, uh, goes away and we lose those the, the, the Sashura and like the, the end stopped um, tercets to this kind of enjammed, more free flowing second half of the poem. Um, it's a really, really cool use of enjambment, I think. Especially given, like, I also think it's like the, well, I haven't talked about the Roman numerals, um, like they're supposed to feel like little chapters. And I mean, you would never read a book where one sentence goes from chapter two into chapter three, and yet that's happening now that fate has kind of had its way with the poem in the same way that fate had its way with the boat. Um, notes here. Uh, so, you know, I kind of highlighted just some more, um, this almost prepared a sinister mate. Um, this almost feels like biblical, like Adam and Eve, a kind of, uh, um, kind of turned on its head, uh, undermining that, that relationship that <clears throat> for every, um, boat that man makes God or the imminent will makes this thing that is going to sink it in this case, an iceberg. Um, uh, gaily here being used ironically. So I put it in there. It's fun to talk about irony when you're writing essays. And as the smart ship grew in stature, grace, and hue, in shadowy silent distance grew the iceberg too. So most obviously we have the repetition of the word grew, um, show, which, you know, grew and grew and grew. You can like hear it, hear both things getting bigger, expanding. Um, I also like the, uh, the use of the word smart here. The smart ship, obviously, um, in context, probably you would say smart means um, like sharp, good looking, uh, but we have the obvious version of like smart to mean intelligent that we're giving that, um, either the captain driving this thing or the engineers that made it, or maybe the ship itself, some kind of sentience that this thing is smart, so it will not run into icebergs. <clears throat> Stands a nine. Um, alien, they seem to be, no mortal eye could see the imminent welding of their later history, I love it, of their later history. Such a cool uh, use of language. Um, I highlighted this line here. This is almost certainly, though I was unable to um, verify this when I was doing a little research this morning, almost certainly an allusion to a poem called The Tiger by William Blake, which we will almost certainly read this semester. I, it's, it's, it's awesome. Um, I suggest you check it out um, regardless. It's short, it's it's very cool poems called The Tiger, T-Y-G-E-R, William Blake. Um, and the only other thing I, I specifically highlighted here was the word welding, the welding of their later history. Again, taking the, and it's an ironic use of diction, right? Uh, we weld ships together, um, but the ship here is being welded to um, like kind of forever entwined, pushing itself towards this iceberg in its future. Or sign that they were bent by paths coincident on being a non twin twin halves of one August or August event. Um, I just like all the word choices in here. Um, coincidence, uh, just a different way to consider fate. Um, two halves, this is how, this is actually a pretty good definition for uh, for twain, which we'll get back to in a second. Um, August means like kingly, regal, big, and it is big, it is loud, it is something that will, uh, you know, they certainly didn't know there would be a movie made about it 80 years later, um, and, it, and then it would still be um, a cultural touchstone. I mean. 
boats sink, planes fall out of the sky, we still know the Titanic, right? Um, even when how Hardy wrote this, like it was still basically that year, still 1912 when he wrote this. Um, all that is to say, ironic use um, uh, of the word August. And finally, till the spinner of the years, it's great, uh, another uh, way to consider what fate is or God, imminent will, the thing that keeps time going. Till the spinner of the years said, now, and each one hears and consummation comes and jars two hemispheres. Consummation bringing together two, two things, consider what it means to like consummate a wet marriage, for instance, um, and jars two hemispheres. Um, it's such a, such a I mean, literally global concept, like what a hemisphere is, but to take these two things that are um, really defined by each other and have them finally uh, connect is, is, is really beautiful use of words, but again, being very, very ironic given what is um, at stake here and what he's talking about. Um, so pardon me while I just kind of uh, address some of my notes here. Um, uh, as, as I mentioned, he, he wrote this uh, for, a, for a fundraiser to, to raise money. Um, and pretty, um, so what I'm looking for, obviously doesn't mention uh, the 2,206 deaths at all in the poem. Um, going back to the title as the uh, prompt asks us to the convergence of the twain. Twain is two things being separated. And so the idea that they're coming back, to, back together um, is something uh, that the, at least the writer of this prompt thought would be helpful to consider when we're thinking about what attitude the speaker has about the sinking of the ship. Um, so when we read that it's about the loss of the Titanic, there's probably a few things that we expect. Uh, we might expect that it's about uh, the chaos of the event. Um, we might expect that it's some kind of like funeral dirge, something emotional and sad about the loss, the loss of life. Uh, and it's really none of those things. Um, it's very much about uh, fate in a way, um, fate and, and, and hubris specifically. So again, uh, Bear with me if I'm just reading from my papers here. I'm just jotting things down at the bottom of my, uh, my version of the text. So it's not, I wouldn't say that the attitude is exactly detached, but I think if you argued that he's detached, uh, that would be totally defensible. I, I just don't want to go so far to say detachment because of a few moments. Um, for instance, sinister. I think there's a, a certain connotation there that he doesn't sound totally um, like above this as, as a speaker, but I think you could make a pretty good case um, that he's overall, that the feeling of detachment is, is heavily pervasive here. Um, maybe one, a, a different way that I might approach it would say like an attitude of inevitability um, juxtaposed against an attitude of kind of laughing at uh, human uh, futility. And, and, and arrogance and, and, and hubris, uh, which we really, really see a lot of going on up here. Um, human folly, overconfidence, that stuff. Um, and then the introduction of the imminent will and that shift in structure almost serves as a way to kind of laugh at those architects and those builders and the captain, um, and by extension, us, we who think we can control uh, nature that we can control the world, fate, we can build things that will overcome anything we want is just silly, it's, it's folly. Um, and I mean, history, if you're looking for like a way that you might conclude or introduce this kind of essay, like history gives us ample examples and the, the Titanic is just the one um, that Thomas Hardy here decided to, to, to center in on. Um, so that probably went way longer than I expected. Hopefully it was useful. I'm um, sorry for like the weird pauses. I've never really done this before. Um, and if I'm looking down at my notes too much or looking at my little face in the screen and it's very distracting, I apologize, but hopefully we get better at this as the semester goes on. Um, I'm gonna try to do a couple more of these this weekend for some of the multiple choice sections. Um, and if not, I'll get them up this week. Thank you guys and I'll see you soon. <laughs>